This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Pensacola sports, past, present, and future on this edition of In Studio. Have you ever taken a minute to think about what a robust sports scene Pensacola has? If not, maybe you should. There's professional hockey, professional baseball, college football, college basketball, college baseball, women's college softball, short track stock car racing, and an impressive array of amateur sporting events. And what about all the world-class athletes that come from the area? They are NFL Hall of Famers, MLB Hall of Famers, Masters and U.S. Open champions, Olympic medalists, NBA and WNBA players. Well, you get the idea. On this edition of In Studio, we're going to look back at Pensacola's sports scene. We'll also look ahead and we'll talk about what's going on right now. Our guests work in sports media or the business of sports in Pensacola. Bill Valona is one of the Southeast's most respected and accomplished sports journalists. Journalist. He spent over 30 years covering sports for the Pensacola News Journal and its parent company, Gannett. He took an early retirement from full-time newspaper work in January of 2019. These days, he is senior writer for BlueWahoos.com and continues to contribute to PNJ.com. Paul Chestnut was the original voice of the Pensacola Ice Pilots hockey team. His career in Pensacola spans over 20 years. Currently, he is sports director and host of Sports Roundtable on WPNN Radio 103.7 FM and 790 AM. He keeps his play-by-play -play uh, skills sharp as voice of the Pensacola Ice Flyers hockey team, as well as calling many high school football games. Ray Palmer is president and chief executive officer of Pensacola Sports, which happens to be Florida's first and oldest sports commission. Ray has led the charge in ramping up Pensacola's sports tourism business through events like fishing tournaments, triathlons, collegiate national championships, and the recently formed Deluna Beach Games. Pensacola Sports also produces awards and scholarship banquets. Chad Brilliante has been in sports broadcasting for a little over a decade. Six of those years have been spent in the Pensacola market. Along the way, Chad has worked with the MLB Network and ESPNU. Currently, he works for ESPN Pensacola 94.5 FM, where he is sports director and hosts Sports Drive with Chad Brilliante. The show is also simulcast on Blab Television. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you. Thank you for having Thank us. Yeah, Thank you for having us. us. Bill, let me begin with you. What is it about Pensacola that makes it such a attractive place for, for sporting teams and such an attractive place for athletes to grow up and go on to great success? Jeff, I think really when you go across the United States, there's probably not another community like Pensacola our size that have this amount of phenomenal athletes. I mean, we could do a, round, a Mount Rushmore of athletes and leave somebody off who's world class. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about Emmett Smith, Derek Brooks, Don Sutton, Roy Jones Jr., Bubba Watson, Justin Gatlin, Jerry Pate, I mean, think of this. Yeah. These are men who have transcended not only Florida, but they've transcended the United States in, in their in their. Uh, performance and their legacies and not to mention for female athletes you know you talk about somebody like Michelle Snow we just have so many and I just think part of it is this is a close-knit community mm -hmm. I think there's a, a, a real um, work ethic that these athletes have all carried maybe established through their environment their parents it's just something about this area that has just produced a drive because you can be a great athlete but these folks have taken it way above to world-class level. We're blessed. I mean, this is a, a special place, I, I think, in America, frankly, with this kind of legacy of athletes. Yeah. Ray, what is it? You, you've been around for a long time, involved in Pensacola sports. Why does the community support our sports so much? I mean, we just see, we, we've always seemed thirsty and, and, and all in all, by and large, been pretty supportive of various teams, events, amateur events, so on and so well, forth. Well, I think, um, I think to, to Bill's point, uh, to expand a little bit on Bill's point is, I think the representation, not just on the field, uh, of play, but 
the way that our superior athletes have promoted our own community back. Mm -hmm. You know, Roy Jones was famous with, for his Pensacola in oh, yeah. the house line yeah. and, um, and Justin and all those guys talk about Pensacola when they win yeah. and they've all shown a lot of class. We've had very few incidences with our, our professional athletes. So I think Pensacola it makes you proud. It does. So I, I think that's one of the reasons that the community is proud to support those guys because they, they represent us so well. Paul, you came down from the Northeast quite a few years ago and you were the original announcer of the Pensacola Ice Pilots. When you first got to this community, what was your impression? Well, first off, I, I had a taste a little bit after my senior year in high school. I, I spent almost a summer in Pensacola. So when the, the hockey was going to come on down here to Pensacola, I wanted to be a part of it. Uh, the team in Nashville, believe it or not. Uh, that was uh, in the league was moving on down here. Nashville these days, they got the NHL team, and it's just right. a city that is just thriving right okay. now. But I, I had a feeling I was working uh, with the team in Erie, Pennsylvania. Erie went to Baton Rouge. I knew that it was going to work here because the ECHL, uh, when first joined Pensacola, it was going south. It was going to Norfolk, Hampton Roads. It was going to South Carolina. That was Charleston, South Carolina, and it was uh, it was booming. These these big uh, crowds were coming on out. Tallahassee was a, was a team, and then Pensacola got one, and it was all of I-10. Mm -hmm. You know, Biloxi, Baton Rouge, uh, Lafayette, New Orleans, uh, as well. So uh, it was it was perfect. It was like a college football setting yeah. that you have, you know, with the SEC with all these hockey teams, and uh, I knew at that time that uh, hockey was going to work here. And and I threw the dice coming down here is what I did. <laughs> I remember talking, and you know, my mom and my grandmother were, were alive at the time. I'm in the parking lot, they're crying. They go, "What? Why are you doing this? Why you want to? Why you want to do? You know, I was 30 years old, single, and saying." You know, this is what I want to do. I'll, I'll be back in two weeks. If this doesn't work out. <laughs> and yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Right, Mobile had a team as well. Yeah, I mean, that that, that well. I-10 corridor yeah, was really created as synergy. I mean, the instant rivalries yeah. for a sport that this part of the world just didn't know very well. Mm -hmm. But tell me, we don't want to beat Mobile? Are you kidding me? Yeah, I want to uh, beat Mobile yeah. at everything, right? Were, were you guys were you guys surprised at how quickly Pensacola embraced hockey? I mean, because you know we love football around here. That's a big deal. Love baseball too, but the hockey, and, and there had been some attempts at basketball that had not been as successful, but I mean, the hockey thing is, bam, it was on fire. Well, you know, Jeff, to Paul's point, bat, the, there was a lot of concern uh, of whether this was going to work because the basketball, as you referenced, <clears throat> had failed. We had the tornadoes. Ray knows. Paul remembers that the tornadoes came in. They they didn't do well. That was when, and that was when the NBA wasn't as large as it is, right. as it is now. You had really great players here, mm -hmm. but people just didn't care. The hockey team came in, and from the get-go, they had, and Paul knows they they had seven thousand, six thousand. My all, one of my all-time memories, and Paul worked this game. It was a playoff game. I was driving down that ramp to the Civic Center, Bay Center now. Right. People were outside scalping and searching for tickets. I thought, am I really living this? I mean, here in Pensacola, people are struggling to get in uh, to a sold-out playoff game. And Paul did, you know, wonderfully some of the most unbelievable moments in hockey history here. And for this sport to have thrived 20 plus years now is really a testament to the community. Well, I remember I had a conversation with you and Nathan Dominitz right. who was working with you at the time too. You guys were a little bit skeptical. And I, I was kept very on saying, skeptical, and I, not and a I little. Kept on saying, <laughs> I was very skeptical. I'm saying, <laughs> I've seen it, this is going to work. I yeah. remember. And, and this is going to work. And I remember going to Biloxi for the first game. Bruce Boudreaux, who I believe right now is the head coach of the uh, Minnesota Wild. Mm -hmm. He he was uh, head coach of uh, the Biloxi team, Mississippi Seawolves. They delayed that game. All right, it was delayed for about half hour, forty five minutes. It worked there too. They sold it out. They yeah. packed it in. And I remember walking in, meeting Bruce Bucci, dressed in a tuxedo, you know, <laughs> to to you know uh, to coach that game. And and they delayed it. And what what I also remember is that 
we didn't have our official jerseys. We had to wear our practice jerseys. <laughs> so we lose that game. We go to Birmingham. The very next day, we lose that game. So the following weekend's opening weekend, we sell out, sold out. So we got our own two. We end up winning. I could still remember a kid named Jeff Mead, game-winning goal, two goals in that game. I remember the wave, how, how the fans were just so into it. Uh, and we beat the Tallahassee Tiger Sharks. I mean, everything came into play that opening night in that first year. Yeah. That first year, the last game of the regular season, we're playing Baton Rouge. Uh, Huntington, West Virginia, ha had to lose. We had to win. It all worked out. We're the last team that gets in. So we go on and play the, uh, I believe, the Tallahassee Tiger Sharks, who were the number one team. Uh, we were the last seeded team. We ended up sweeping them. And I can remember it was like Easter weekend. And I can remember, you know, it was a Kelly Hawkins still making that, uh, uh, the shot, I believe it was in, uh, in, in, in overtime. And he lives you know, here the, now. Yeah, still, still, yeah, still lives here. He's a businessman. So yeah. many amazing, so many amazing yeah. games. We had, we had Wayne Gretzky's uh, brother, Brent Gretzky, that played mm -hmm. on the team. Uh, you know, Chad Quinville is still, here. still yep. here, very successful, yep. uh, and doing what he does. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. as, a, as an investor, he was the captain of the team for, for, for three years. Did not miss a game. Yeah. You know, one of the things. And he's that, in the Pensacola Sports Hall of Fame. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, a couple of quick stories. One is my wife, who is absolutely not a sports fan, <laughs> I had been to my first NHL game in January of the year the Ice Pilots came in, and I just, hockey fascinated me. They said, You need to go to an NHL game. And I was in Dallas, went. So that first game, I told the wife, I had three little boys. I said, I have tickets for hockey. She said, This is the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> I cannot believe you're taking me and that they think hockey is going to be a success in Pensacola. I said, just go with me. By the second period, she had moved from the other end of the boys to the seat next to me and said, can we get tickets tomorrow night? By then, we had season tickets for years on end, and that's what we did every single game. The little boys had jerseys. We went and spent the night in Tallahassee for the first playoff game. It became – but the, the – team did a phenomenal job of engaging those players into the community. Yeah, if you remember, yeah. Bill, and you do, I know you were a big part of it, Paul. They were everywhere. Mm -hmm. Those players were mm -hmm. everywhere. And Ray's story typifies why they were so successful, how they hooked people on the sport who are still season ticket holders yep. today. And it is remarkable because all of those other teams we talked about, Mobile, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, they're gone. Pensacola is the one team still left who has a successful franchise. Playoff game sold out in two hours. And yeah, we're not talking 5,000. We're not talking 6,000. We're talking like over 8,000 fans. Yeah. We had to put up seats all the way up at the top yeah. to, to fit more people in. Yeah. To, to get in two, two, two hours. We're talking two hours of a playoff game sold out. That's amazing. That was an exciting time. You were just a kid at the time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and you weren't here, so, <laughs> no. so we're a bunch of old guys sitting around talking, so we'll, we'll get you into the My conversation. My hockey player is Happy Gilmore. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get you in the conversation now. What brought you to Pensacola? I actually got lucky. Uh, Ray knows the better half of me, uh, who is much better than me uh, as, as family friends. No, but, no. Uh, yeah. but uh, I met her on the first night I ever was here. At the uh, There was a thing called Gallery Night going on. It was the first one at an old blah zoo's. Stopped by, got lucky to go in the right place, and met her on the dance floor. And and uh, never been to Pensacola, first night ever. And uh, now it's home, got a family, and uh, just great people. And, and you look around this room and this table, and the experience that you can you can learn from, and the people that put their passion into the city. I've worked in a lot of markets, big markets, where it's the hustle and bustle, but you're a commodity, meaning that everybody just goes to their job. Where the people in Pensacola, whether it's with you know four different companies, we all work together. We all we always see each other, grab lunch together, our friends together, and that's something that is just like the sports scene, not just with broadcasters, but you see a Derek Brooks or a Reggie Evans or a Fred Robbins or a Adron Chambers and people that played in different times and different eras, different sports, and they all come up and it's like they just get together as best friends again. And that's one of the coolest things that I see in Pensacola. Yeah. 
You know, that, that, that whole hockey thing, I think it did just kind of change the landscape when I think back on it because we mentioned, you know, you had the Pensacola Tornadoes. And here, here's one I'll throw at you. Do you remember, do you remember the Wings, the yes. football team? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I don't think that lasted very no. long. No, and we had the Barracudas with, with the hockey, the indoor football. You'd have it, thought yeah. that was going to take off. It didn't. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean. What was the women's football team? Power. Oh, the yeah. Power. That's right. Power. 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 Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there has been a lot of attempts to, to have uh, minor league professional sports, but obviously uh, the ice flyers turned, uh, ice pilots turned ice flyers, and the Blue Wahoos have, have done it, and, yeah. they, and they've made, and they've changed Pensacola. Yeah. Now we've Come got on. some uh, pro, um, the, um, top level soccer going on out there. I know they're playing Tallahassee Saturday night, mm -hmm. the, whatever the, that level of the pro, pro soccer going yeah. on now. And they're, the teams win too. Yeah. I mean, the teams win. That's another thing, Paul. Yeah. If, if, if they won three SPHL championships in a four or five year span, right. most, if you're not winning, people are going to be, you know, shaky to get down to the games. And that's one thing. If you continue to win, those fans that were borderline, let's go down and watch a game between a team 20 games below or fighting for a chance at the playoffs, that's a, it's a lot different on Friday night. That's a good point. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned the thing about your wife and hockey. So my daughter's not a real big sports fan, but she's kind of into hockey. So she likes the Chicago Blackhawks. And so, so we kind of got, she kind of got turned on to that. And of course, we go down and watch, watch the Ice Flyers play and everything. What do you think it is about the game of hockey that seem, seems to bring in not your traditional sports fan? Well, I think it's uh, just the people involved and the players. Uh, you know, I've, I've got the interview. I cover all the sports, got the interview, some some great names. And, and I think, uh, you know, the hockey players are the easiest to work with. Uh, you just saw their NHL award show, just saw their NFL draft, the Stanley Cup final in uh, St. Louis winning it all yep. and what they did uh, for, for Layla. It was just amazing. Right. You know, a kid who's 11 years old, St. Louis flying her and her family to, to the game. They, it, charity work. Right. They do a bunch of that. Right. Uh, hockey does. But I think they're just like everyday, everyday people. Yeah. Uh, the players are even at the highest level in the NHL. And they treat everybody the same just on the way that they were brought up. And I, I just think the fans take to it. It's, it's, it's different. They're on skates. It's yeah. it's like it's yeah, fast, you know, it's amazing. Athleticism and, on ice yeah. right. at the p speed yeah. live is <laughs> amazing. And it doesn't hurt living in Florida to have for uh, you know take a date out there and it's always air conditioned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's that helps as well. That's right. That's right. I, I think it's especially at the base. That's it's right. Air <laughs> well, you better bring a parka if you're gonna get out there. Yeah. See a couple Eskimo coats out there. Um, but it's the energy and passion. There's a lot of sports also where you look at. Uh, a sport, you could have a baseball game, and, and I love baseball, I grew up around baseball, but it could be 11 to one, and you're just waiting in the third inning for that game, you know, six innings later, looking at your watch because you know it's already in the bag. Most games in, in hockey, there's always action going on because there's barely any whistles, so there's always energy, and it's usually always close. Mm -hmm. There's been a couple ice fire games where they've blown the team out, but overall, it's, it's within three goals, that kind of range, where you're mm -hmm. always using that excitement and energy, whether you're rooting your team on to keep the lead or to get back in the game. Right. And I think that keeps people up. They're, they're excited. They're not sweating as much, and, and they're enjoying it, where there's other sports where it can be over by halftime, and you're just sort of looking at the watch to go home. And, and in hockey, 6-1, it's that. legal fighting. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, that's <laughs> it. But that's, I wasn't going to be the first that, one to say that, but that's well, why. You know, there that's is, it, it's fascination yeah. that they let them. Duke it out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Very it's unique. In the that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Come box. And then come playoff time, you have the overtime. The, the overtime. Yep. Well, I mean, as far as you go with a game seven and overtime, it's amazing. Yeah. Nothing better yeah. in, in sports than uh, playoff hockey, especially when it goes into overtime. Winner, it's such, you know, they're enthused, an emotional yeah. lift, and the loser is like, ah. Oh, you know, <laughs> such a momentum change yeah, yeah. just by watching it and how fast paced it is. And what is at stake come playoff time? Yeah, and yeah. dentists love sport, uh, getting to scout their next patient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One sport that I do yeah. think, Ray, if you want to have, you know, add on that, we're talking about arena football, because I was involved with that too. And what happened back then, you had arena football and then you had AF2, and that's what Pensacola was. And so what they did was that they 
they they piggybacked all these ECHL teams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So same ownership so group. Same ownership group. So you have the same ownership group with the same staff doing both. And so some you know some people got kind of got tired of it. So it, mm -hmm. it worked for three years. It was but I remember cannibalism of I, themselves. Right. Was, right. Uh, the the first year I could remember the first what four or five games sold out. The yeah. first arena football game, mm -hmm. AF2 game in Pensacola was amazing. It was amazing doing it. It was, it was very fast paced. Fans got into it. But I think when, as you mentioned, Ray, you had, you know, the ownership group owned both. I think if you do do it the right way, and I see where arena football is now these days, you know, but if they ever get it back, and you do bring an, an owner in here that just wants to do arena football and they do it the right way, you know, as far as one, one ownership group with that, I, I think it could possibly go. You just, think indoor soccer could ever come back again here? That was, those games were a bunch of right, fun. Right, I remember we Jimmy Graham that. was the coach and I can't remember who the ownership guy was, a local guy. And, you know, but uh, indoor uh, soccer was, and now soccer, of course, is, continues to, boom. to, to boom. track yeah, up. Yeah. I think, again, it's all dependent upon who's running it and how they market it. Yeah, absolutely. Corporate I, base is... Exactly. I mean, the the good thing about the ICE Flyers is the owner, Greg Harris, lives in the community. The great thing about the Blue Wahoos is the owner, Quentin Richie Studer, they live in the community. Everybody is stays here year-round. They both franchises work year-round to try to sell tickets right. because that's... That's what you have to do to, to get a season ticket base up and to get those group outings and those per game sales to make your, your bottom line. And corporate, I think, I mean, sponsors. the Ice Flyers have drawn over 100,000 fans in 28 games and the Blue Wahoos have drawn over 300,000 for 70 games. That's phenomenal for a market our size. It is phenomenal. How big a deal do you think it was when Quint Studer made the big time commitment to baseball? Because I mean, originally with the Pelicans and, and then with the Blue Wahoos and uh, you know, the double A team for the, for the Reds at the time and now Minnesota. I mean, that, that's a big deal for our community in, in my judgment. Jeff, I think it, it's the single most uh, transformational element that's happened to our community. I, I, I don't think Pensacola is where we are right now without the Blue Wahoos. I say that from a community standpoint, a downtown standpoint, and to think what Quint and Rishi Studer had to go through to get this stadium. It, I mean, it passed a vote and then it was five, almost five years later before they broke ground. I mean, it was a long time. And he fought, most people in that in that realm and that and an owner like that would have walked away yeah, yeah. he didn't he he would believed in this community he believed it would be a success it has changed downtown it has changed pensacola we wouldn't be where we are without that and what it's led to yeah. that's the biggest thing yeah, yeah it's I, pretty incredible i mean the, the the team itself it is a, an atmosphere unlike any other minor league stadium too in a city that you're always going to get a nice nice bay breeze right there. You get the fireworks. They, they really put time and effort into thinking about the little things, too, for the kids, uh, for the fans, with their concessions, everything to really get involved with people that might not be maybe your fair weather baseball fan right. that just wants to enjoy a Saturday at the park. Uh, the fireworks shows are great. They're right. like the 4th of July, and getting to bring the family out there, sit on the hill, and enjoy the time is, is amazing. But one thing that they do is with the – I've done minor league baseball games in places when I was in Las Vegas. <laughs> Shocking. People don't go out to Vegas on planes to go to minor league baseball. I found that out. They want to go to things like Bellagio's and casinos. But when you're out there, there's not as much of that atmosphere where people actually wear Wahoo gear in town and want to be fans, right. where most of the time it's just a team trying to get to the majors, and that's what they look at it, where guys actually don't mind staying here for a little while. Well, I mean, when you sit in that stadium, I mean, you, you just have to look at how beautiful the stadium is. And, and like you're talking about, taking care of the little things and just, just I mean, it's magic. And, and you have to say to yourself, for those of us who have been around for a while and know the challenges that the Studers went through to get that there, I mean, it's just like, can you believe they had to go through? All to, it's a, it's a no-brainer now, you know. The other thing, in my judgment, that I think has been a big um, – 
transformational event for uh, Pensacola sports and the sports scene has been the University of West Florida getting a football team. Right. And, you know, uh, gosh, Dr. Judy Bentz, you know, making that, you know, come to fruition. And, and I mean, how cool is that? And you take a look at the photograph on the scene there. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? That's a game changer, too. It was. And again, what has elevated UWF football is having Blue Wahoo Stadium yeah. to play. There is no Division II location in America to match it. And their attendance has reflected it. Their, their attendance for Division II is in the top 20 for a program that's only, you know, four years old. It's remarkable. But again, it can't happen without Blue Wahoo Stadium. If they had gone to a high school venue, oh, yeah. just pick a high school, it wouldn't have had the same impact. You wouldn't have had the same crowd. We might not be talking about UWF football like we are now. From the get-go, the opening night that they played in that stadium, it was magical. And I think mm -hmm. that's, that's why you're seeing and, and look how it's transformed they it. They even guarantee a perfect sunset. I right, mean, that exactly. Is, that's, <laughs> I think that's the biggest and thing. And that's such a recruiting tool, too, yeah. Right. obviously, you know, for the players. They go on up onto the campus at UWF, hey, you want to come on down and see our stadium? Yeah. Boom, right there. And I also think that they got the right guy as the head say, coach. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And Pete yeah. Shinnick. And I, they could have, that was a home run hit yep. in getting him. So community... Mm -hmm. Uh, driven and successful and, and doing has time for everybody yep. they they made a home run with Pete Chinnick. yeah that whole organization out there they've just done a tremendous job and it's really in my I, I just think it really has helped transform uh, transform the community no question you, know, you see some stats out there where people throw things in that are just ancillary type stats where you know a team in negative 15 degree weather on Sundays uh, usually are three and four, and you're like, what am I going to make of that stat at all? Like, I don't even know what's happening. Where, <laughs> When you look at what UWF has done, when you have a stat, you are the first in the history of any program in two years to make the postseason, and then you go to the championship as an underdog four times right. and get all the way to the national title game. That's something you sit back in shock. And that's the thing is, they're not just doing things that are great rah-rah for the local scene, which everybody supports the teams. They're doing things that nobody's ever seen in this country, and that's amazing. And one of the advantages that they have is they have a great place to recruit because Pensacola and Northwest Florida has always been well known for having great high school athletes and particularly in the world of football. So that's got to be huge for them moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I think, and they've reached out and they've done a great job trying to get some of those guys. The key is that, you know, a lot of the guys from our area, they, and I think people don't understand this, Jeff, some of them just want to play elsewhere because they, they want a new, you know, a fresh start. But UWF has recruited some local guys yeah. that have helped them, certainly on that national title run team. There were local guys on that team that were big factors in that, in that run. But, I, I, again, it, it, it's brought an awareness to UWF yeah. more than anything that I don't think existed before. Right. I mean, everybody knew UWF has a call, but that football success – elevated the brand UWF yeah. and I think you're it's reflective in their enrollment it's a reflective in their fundraising it's reflective in their marketing I think Ray's seen a few come through the Pensacola sports with all the high school all-star games and football over the years absolutely and now get to yeah. stay home at UWF absolutely but but I, yeah, there was a real challenge out there because the environment was so successful I mean, you talk about their golf team and tennis mm -hmm. teams that have won national championships and been competitive. And the quality of the coaches out there are phenomenal. I mean, those guys, and they stay. The longevity mm -hmm. of them is amazing. Mm -hmm. And to bring in football was a real challenge because they had to embrace that. And there was some concern that how will it be embraced. But Judy Benz is, she's a very unique individual, and she knew football would set the bar a little bit higher and it would be the front porch because she believed and that was the the, the face of the of the university was going to be in the athletics and foot, we needed football to take us to that next thing and she stood behind that and Pete you're right uh, Paul Pete was the right pick to go out there and, and meld with those coaches and now they just added Kristen Dorsey which is a phenomenal local hire as their women's golf coach this uh, just last week right yeah. exactly and great choice local girl been very successful and she will bring right. high quality to well not that it's not quality but it, it she will be 
a real asset out yeah. there, another it's asset. Good, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the future where they want to play because you hear all, all this talk that they want to go on, you know, build something in a stadium on campus. Who knows? Why yeah. would they want to leave <laughs> that stadium downtown? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell be, you why they would want to, whether they will or not or what's the right thing. And to me is because college athletics are about the students first. And so to be on campus because it is not – Two miles from downtown, yeah. you know, and, and you know, you want to be that the college athlete, the college student wants the experience of walking across campus and going to that. So that's the battle, and they have obviously have a local company who has invested into a beautiful turf field out there. And how do they balance that? Whether they play a couple of games here and a couple of games, uh, I don't know. But it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next couple of years because yeah. you know, there's college experiences. I want to go to college. I want to mm -hmm. go to be able to go mm -hmm. to football game, and I want to cro walk across campus. So UCF did that. Uh, there's going to be some real challenges in decision making there. Of course, the other side of the coin is how many college students get to walk across campus to a beautiful stadium on the bay in yeah. a nice environment. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what the decisions are going to be made, yeah. as, especially as UWF moves to a downtown, more and more downtown presence. Yeah. Fascinating conversation we're having here. We are going to continue this great conversation about Pensacola sports. We're looking kind of at the past, the present, and the future. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. You're watching In Studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast, our guest Chad Brilliante from ESPN Pensacola 94.5 FM, Ray Palmer with Pensacola Sports, Bill Valona with BlueWahoos.com, and he's also a contributor to PNJ.com, and also Paul Chestnut, voice of the Pensacola Ice Flyers and also radio show host of Sports Drive on WPNN Radio 103.7 FM, FM and 790 AM. And, um, Question for you radio guys here. You know, there's a lot of talk, particularly in the big markets, New York, Chicago, L.A. So talk sports radio is really a vibrant thing, and you get all kinds of characters calling in. What kind of folks call in and talk to you? <laughs> well, it, I guess when you listen to Feinbaum, sometimes you can't ever hit that window. So, I mean, <laughs> the callers around here are respectful. Uh, they're good sports fans. They're passionate. But one thing working in this market uh, that's really cool, Jeff, is that you get an opportunity uh, to really cover so many different sports and so many different teams where there's, you know, if you, you have like a quota of how much time you're watching that tick in some cities like a Boston or Chicago, if you get away from their major league teams. Right. So we're down here, uh, the, the big five, Alabama, you hear a couple roll tides when you go out in the streets, right. you know, LSU, Florida, yeah. Florida State. And then Auburn. Those are probably the five. And then you've got your Troys and South Alabamas, uh, the teams, obviously, what UWF and the local teams. But then, you know, the Saints fans. You have fans from all over. A lot of people, because of Pensacola NAS and the beaches, brings in a number of people from all over the country. So it's not just one team. And it's fun because when you have a breaking story, you don't feel as bad that you're taking time away from those fans that are just salivating because they got off work and they have a 15 minute drive <laughs> and they want to hear about just Braves baseball or something right. in a market where you have to talk. So I've really respected that. It makes our job easier. I know, Paul, and you know, we get to cover a platform of sports and events like the Senior Bowl, Blue Wahoos, Pensacola sports yeah. events each and every week. So uh, it's always, it's, it's a blast. I'm, it's I'm it's one of my favorite I'm kind moments. of old school, Jeff. <laughs> You know, because uh, I'm, but what I care about is what they do on the field. I don't care about 
the other stuff right. that that happened. So I'm old school. I go straight to the source. And I just make everything I go up, straight. So I go. We're pretty good. I go straight to the source. You know, I'll, I'm there Sunday Saints training camp, mini camp was just there two straight weeks. OTAs mini camp. Goes, there's big Saints fans in this area. Oh, yeah. We're proud to be a part of, uh, you know, the Saints Radio Network, WPNN. Also, Alabama football, Eli Gold comes on uh, as well. Uh, the Reese Senior Bowl had the opportunity five years in a row now broadcasting that game for oh, the wow. Pensacola market out there all week. So I don't mess around. I, I go st straight to the source and and, and, and get it straight for our listeners. Yeah. You know, that's the cool thing about our market is because where we are in Florida, you know, you have Florida, you have Florida, Florida State fans, mm -hmm. L, big time LSU uh, contingent here, Alabama, Auburn. And sometimes when I talked to, I was talking to a gentleman the other day in Boston, he's like, oh, are you, you know, Tampa Bay fan or Jacksonville fan? And I go, well, no, not really. <laughs> I said, you know, so for, for me personally, I'm a Miami Dolphins fan first and foremost, and then a New Orleans Saints fan. And, you know, I explained to him, I said, you know, the, 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 I was a kid, grew up in Florida and the Dolphins were here, you know, well before Jacksonville or Tampa, and then the Saints, you know, were so close by, and and, and what a great team they were that just is. Awful though for so many oh, years. The, so, the Saints. Oh yeah, <laughs> which is yeah. why they're embraced now. Oh, big you time. Know, because of the people like yourself that grew up here, Ray, and remember mm -hmm. them being awful. Now they're one of the elite NFL teams, Absolutely. and so it's easy to be well, a fan. Not only on the field and what they do and, and what they preach in the community, but also. You know, the entertainment factor, I believe they were voted the, the most entertaining place to be at for an NFL game was at the Mercedes-Benz Superdome. Yeah. It's different. Yeah. I'm used to, you know, Pittsburgh, <laughs> Cleveland, old school Buffalo, and coming on, it, it is a big party, you know, there. And last year, I mean, the players, they were winning, they were dominating, they were playing the loud music. They started, the, when they had the... 30-point lead in the fourth quarter. They started to do some dancing on the <laughs> sidelines, and the fans got into it. Yeah. And they were playing up with one another. And well, technology has changed so much when it comes to radio and even television today because of, you know, even today, you, United, you know, a team, if a team wins a big game, you already know, but I do a drive time in the afternoon at 5. Most people have already got their headlines by right. that time. Where back in the day, they were waiting, and maybe that was their five-minute window. Most people are scrolling through Facebook or on their phone. They already know things happening and late-breaking, the da na da na na So you know when trades are happening, breaking news stories. They're even breaking news stories that are just rumors these days. A rumor, <laughs> this guy might go here breaking them. So that's not fake even a story. News. What is this? Fake but, news. Yeah, exactly, the, the good old fake news. And, and that's the thing is... Uh, today, it's changed where it's more topical and conversational pieces. That's why the call-ins, the people talking, getting people to feel like they're part of the show is important on their opinion because everybody's opinion's right until they play the game. And uh, I think it's that's one thing that's fascinating about the sports radio world. I, I've worked in it about 12 to 13 years in the radio side, and over the 13 years when phones, flip phones started to come out to now, you can see a change in not just the headlines, but to get involved in the big stories. What about, and, and this is not so much a Pensacola question, but just maybe an overall question. You think Twitter is good or bad for the athletes? Because some of them seem to get themselves Depends in trouble. Depends on how they use it, Jeff. I mean, and I think right. it's good or bad for anybody. I mean, look at the politicians, the public officials. Look at everybody who's got themselves in trouble. And you're thinking to yourself, you know, how could they be this stupid? Yeah. You know, to put this out there and not think it's going to get saved or or captured, as they say, and, and regurgitated. I mean, it is amazing to me, but it's, I think it's allowed them to get their, their message out there in the way they want to. But there's, there's definitely been a downside to all the social media. It's gotten so many athletes in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the good thing about Twitter is if you don't like them, you can unfollow them. Unlike there's some, if you don't like the local, you know, whoever's on your local network and or, or the local newspaper or this, you really don't have a choice. You know, you, you listen to them where if you don't like somebody on Twitter, click and move on. But mm -hmm. for the athletes, I think they quickly look at it. But there is there. There's no excuse today because they're told and taught and the guys at the top level, they've got agents and other people a lot of times handling that person's check mark. So it, there is no reason for people unless it's one of those late nights and they're getting home to to go ahead and uh put something stupid out there. Let's talk about some of the great athletes from this area. Let's let's start with baseball. Talk about Don Sutton, you know, who um, 
you know, he's kind of the first one I kind of really remember, remember, you know, from the area and played for the Los Angeles Dodgers. And you probably covered him some. I remember uh, I was in Pittsburgh growing up with like Paul and, and Don Sutton was pitching against the Pirates who then had Hall of Famers like Clemente and Stargell in the lineup. And Don was always successful against them, so I always kidded him, you know, how'd you get Roberto Clemente out all these times? He's one of the, but anyway, uh, Don... He had a trick or two. Yeah, he was, uh, he was tough. Creative. But now, Don will tell you he was not the best pitcher at Tate High School, and there were other pitchers in the community his age that he felt like were better. But what happened, Don kept working and working, and he got that break. You know, back then the draft wasn't, isn't anything like it was right, now. Right. He got a phone call. The Dodgers signed him. Just so happened, all the pieces fell into place, and he makes his debut on a staff that had Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale. <laughs> and you think about that, and yeah. now Don Sutton's part of that. Wow. And I, I think he made it possible for baseball players in Pensacola to say, hey, he did it, yeah. I can too. Look who's followed. Yeah. You know, nobody, nobody's a Hall of Famer like Don Sutton, but we've had so many baseball players. Right. They all will tell you that, you know, especially the older ones, Don Sutton made it possible. He paved the way. And he's been such a great ambassador, too, for our community because yeah. he, he loves Pensacola. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and think about how many of the great players have come out of Tate High School. Right. Where, where Don went. And then, exactly. of course, and, and don't forget Buck Showalter. Who wasn't necessarily a yeah. great player, but a, a great manager my, with the my Yankees. My first job was in the New York Penn League, and I did the Erie Cardinals, and it's a short A rookie league. Two of the players on the team, by the way, Luis Alice and Bien Figueroa, who played for uh, Florida State. But I can remember when the Yankees came on in, they said, okay, you, 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 here, here comes the future manager of the Yankees, and it was Buck Showalter. Wow. And I remember going on up to him, and I talked to him about it on the, at the uh, Pensacola Sports Banquet when he had him right uh, as a guest. It was Ainsworth Field. And I can remember the Yankees, and I was just talking about this, Bill, the other day. Imagine the Yankees being in the, the seven, they playing over Blue Wahoo State. I mean, they came on off the bus, and they were just launching home run after home run. There's, there's a difference there, and I feel, you, you feel it because they, they were based out of Oneonta. But uh, I can remember, you know, everyone talking about Buck Showalter. And he, he, he was a young Buck Showalter with the blonde hair, you know, that, <laughs> and it was like, and, and, he, and he had it. You knew yeah. he had it, that he was gonna, going to make it. And when I approached him at the uh, sports banquet uh, about a couple of years ago, he goes, yeah, I remember that, Ainsworth Field, you know, how, how it was. And, how they had address in the school or whatever, you know, it was, it was just a, you know, great little, great time, great yeah. little moment there. Yeah. But they knew, the organization knew when Buck Showalter joined the Yankees that he was going to be successful yeah. and do what he did. I, I had an opportunity to interview him for my program conversations, and this has been several years ago. He was still working with ESPN at the time, so it was before he took the Orioles job, but it was a great interview. A re and it, just a super nice guy yeah. and, a, and a genuine guy, and um, it, it had some great stories. Talked about Billy Martin and all. You can you can find it on YouTube, Just <laughs> and, and it, it was it was fun. It was cool, cool getting to, to, to think talk. think George Steinbrenner came to Pensacola to try to woo him back <laughs> yeah. after he had already signed to manage the Arizona Diamondbacks. Steinbrenner oh, yeah. flew in here personally went to Buck's home here in Pensacola to try and to think about this you know that was that's a big deal that was a big deal and Buck said no I've already made my mind up if you had any uh, Billy Martin videos I heard I hope they were pre-edited right yeah, yeah, yeah we, we, we didn't roll any okay, Billy just... <laughs> Billy but who did you guys grow up when you were growing up who was your sports hero or or someone you looked up to Ray was it Probably Roger Staubach because Roger Staubach was here, as you may know, in the Navy and played yeah. for the Goshawks here. Yep. And and one of our dear friends, um, uh, 
man lived down the street, uh, Shorty Ward, was an official, was a, a coach and, and, and part of the school system. And Shorty used to take us, because we were neighborhood kids, take us to the games for the gospel. And so I became a Roger Staubach, huge Robert, Roger Staubach fan, because he was a Pensacolian as far as I knew. I know we know where he was really from, but he was. We'd go out there and watch him play for the Goshawks, and he he could throw it 35 yards downfield. Those guys, <laughs> those other you know guys, they couldn't catch it. It was thrown too hard, and of course he he became a a, a, a star for me. Oh yeah, how about how about you, Chad? I, I mean, lately in the news, it's been a little uh, crazy, but uh, Big Poppy was my, I'm being oh, you know, yeah. Boston roots and all, yeah. and just he was just a, like a, a cartoon character watching him all those years and. Uh, every time you knew he was going to step in, there was that aura feeling. And baseball has that where, you know, it's 3 nothing, two outs, but two guys walk, and you just have a feeling this guy's going to hit a home yeah. run. You just watch three and a half hours of a game where nobody could get on base, but you know when this guy's standing up at the plate, he's going to do something. And uh, that World Series after Aaron Boone and some of the moments before that, it just meant that much more. But uh, David Ortiz, but obviously lately with the shootings in the Dominican and some uh -huh. other stuff. But uh, he was always my favorite player. Right? Uh -huh. What about you, Paul? I was spoiled as a kid, so uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh, you're talking. Uh, wow. Chad was going through, you know, City of Chance with yeah. Boston or whatever. I mean, when I was a kid, I thought it was great being in Pittsburgh and you had the Super Bowl run with the Steelers, four yeah. Super Bowls in mm -hmm. six years. Yeah. Yeah. You had the, uh, the, the World Series, 71 and 79, with, with the Pirates as well. Hockey was just starting to get going. It, it fascinated me, yeah. you know, with it. I think the play-by-play -play announcer, Mike Lang, uh, loved listening to him. Uh, but uh, as a kid, uh, I thought I was in, in, in heaven because it just kept on winning championships. And, you know, the Steelers beating Roger Staubach <laughs> and Dallas Cowboys in the, in the Super, Super Bowl, you know, for, for two years. But, but one player that I did take to was Manny Sanguian. Many people may not number 35 for the Pirates in that 71, 79. Loved, he was a catcher, and and I and I saw like Johnny Bench and oh, yeah. played little oh, league yeah. ball. Everybody played little league, or, yeah, or pony league in that. Yeah. And uh, I was a catcher, and one of the reasons why was because of him. Yeah, me too. I was a catcher you know. too. What about you, Bill? Well, you know, like Paul, I I grew up in Pittsburgh, but it's clear it was Roberto Clemente. Right. Um, you know, he was the Latino Jackie Robinson. He broke the barrier for Latino players, and it didn't matter to all of us in school who were in grade school that he didn't speak great English. What mattered was he won baseball games, right, and he knew right. how to play like nobody I have ever seen. He had an arm. I have never seen anybody have an arm like Roberto Clemente. Um, my father and uncle watched Willie Mays in his prime, and they saw Jackie Robinson, but Roberto Clemente to me... Um, changed a, a, a community because the pirates were terrible right. you know now they captivated the city I was too young to remember when Bill Mazeroski hit the famous home run but Roberto Clemente batted over 300 in that world I mean or 500 in that World Series he was a great player and then he just transcended for you know you're talking about somebody who never batted under 300 for his major, for most of his major league career, it was he never went through a slump, and the guy never took batting practice. That was his thing. <laughs> he didn't like it. He, he whatever he did on his own, he did. Right. But he just had a quality that I think for boy, for me, it was magical watching that guy play every my night. My first uh, uh, major league baseball game was, was the Pirates and Reds, and we sat in right field. My brother was a big Clemente fan, and I was fortunate enough to see. Roberto Clemente play. Yeah. And I remember this past year, I'm doing the radio show over at the Blue Wahoo Stadium, and I had Ramon on the, the film manager, and I asked him what, when his first game, and I shared it mine. And I said, Roberto Clemente, and, and his eyes lit up. He goes, Roberto, you, you saw Roberto Clemente play. Yeah. He goes, you, you're kidding. I go, no. Yeah. It's home. It's home. Awesome. I mean, they probably, and maybe yeah. down the road, they, they might retire right. his number 21. Yeah. Yeah. You know, all across the board, like Jackie Robinson, he's had that major influence. It's, it's a shame, and I can remember what happened on New Year's on New Year's Eve. You know, when he was uh, when he and that uh, plane, plane crash, crash. Uh, our whole family was just stunned. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, was it was like it was like somebody in our family mm -hmm. yeah. passed away. For I mean, we were just crushed. But he's a hero stunned. among Latino, yeah. I mean, even today. I mean, you mentioned his name and. Yeah. 
you'll get a reaction. You know, for me, growing up in the Southeast, it was Hank Aaron, mm -hmm. you know, with the Atlanta Braves, obviously. Right. And That's and then the Miami Dolphins, uh, Larry Zonka, remember? Yes. Big number 39, right. the fullback, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that great team the Dolphins had back in the 1970s, and Bob Greasy and Jim Kick and uh, uh, Paul Warfield mm -hmm. and uh, Bonacani and all those guys, who unfortunately, and I guess I'll drift off into this just for a couple of moments, you know, now things are starting to come out with the issues that many of them are having because of the head injuries over the years, and that's really a sad story. Where, where do you think the NFL eventually lands on that? It's, it's there, you know what it's Jeff. It's it's hard to lessen the impact of these collisions. I mean, I, you can have the greatest helmet technology, <clears throat> which they do. You can have the greatest safety. But you're talking about guys today. If you stand on an NFL sideline and watch the speed of these guys and the collisions. It's it, it it'll send chills to it's you. Violent. Well, yeah. I think the accumulation over because these kids start young. The accumulation is probably I, I don't want to say under factored, but um, I think that's a major part of it too. It's not all happening just the NFL level. Like right. You go go stand on the side of a high school okay. game and watch how mm -hmm. fast and violent those kids are in this day and age because they've they've while they've increased the quality of the helmet, it's now perceived as it's a weapon and, oh, I can really, right. and so. Uh, You're right, right. You're right. It's in the high school level, too. It's trickled all the way down. These guys are such good athletes, and they work right. out year-round. Mm -hmm. It comes, I mean, yeah. And I, I thought I was a pretty good high school basketball player. Mm -hmm. The kids today mm -hmm. are so far superior to anything that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My generation was. Well, I remember. I, I remember when I was in high school, and there was a kid who could bench three hundred pounds, and that was a big deal. Right. Oh. Now that's no big deal, right? But it's really <laughs> not even. That's your. That's your everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's sort of a misnomer, though. About it has to be about the size because it's more about. To me, it goes back to the technique of our coaches and the people doing it right no, training right. because you see most injuries, se severe injuries. Because I was a quarterback that, not a good one, I just played it, but uh, mm -hmm. we need to make that clear. So it's like, <laughs> I played it. That but um, my job was to pitch the ball to the good guys and have them run down the field. And, and at that, I mean, they'd pick you up and body slam you. I'm not a big guy. I actually did get body slammed by Joe Cohen, who played for the Florida Gators at Palm Bay. And I remember looking back, and the thing about it was, you knew the risk versus the reward of football. These guys do. At the top level, some of them are yeah. making $1.5 to $2 million a game. A game. So if someone told a lot of people out there, I'll give you a million dollars for three hours, what will you do? Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be a fun reality show. But the difference is, I think in sports today is, these guys, nobody is making kids line up to play football in college. There's more kids to make the game safer. A lot of people are against some of the hits and the 15-yard penalties. For if, to make the game safer and go a route that's safer, I've got no problem with it. But to me, it's like everything. It's like school, like training. Teaching them the right thing at the right level will mold them for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And I think a lot of the youth coaches, not in this area, we've got some good ones, but there's a lot of youth coaches that are just letting them play, and they're not teaching them the basics and how to tackle and do the right things instead of swan diving at people and breaking your neck. Those are the things that I think are important. You cover the Saints, so you see it. I think the NFL is doing a, a great job I do too. as far as, you know, trying to, to eliminate, you know, they, they, they changed the rules, they changed uh, as far as uh, training camp is concerned. I mean, what, just a couple of weeks ago, they said, hey, no more Oklahoma drill. Mm -hmm. To tell you the truth, some of the players probably didn't know what an Oklahoma drill was. Right. I remember Chuck Noll with the Steelers, one of the first things he did training camp, day number one, Oklahoma drill. You know, went at it. I remember playing high school sports. We had it. You know, as far as the the Oklahoma Ray, you remember? I didn't play football. I didn't play football. You remember? Explain. You remember? You remember but I mean, I remember my kids. They and, yeah, it. they played football. They did it. Yeah. Now it's like just taken out. Yeah. yeah. There's one practice training camp. I remember three days. Oh yeah. Not two. Yeah. Yeah, but We're three. talking three. I don't remember three. three but I remember two. You yeah. know, three yeah. days that they went. No water. I mean, that was right. Now it's just. I think the NFL's doing a. The best that they can, as far as making it safety for, for everybody, even and they teach it even down on the uh, pee wee level. Yeah. I'm getting real short on time. A couple of things I want to touch on. Another big uh, sport in Northwest Florida that there's been a lot of success with in our area that oftentimes is overlooked is uh, stock car racing. I mean, Five Flag yes. Speedway and the Snowball Derby is a legendary short track uh, racing. Uh, you've covered it. So glad you brought that up, Jeff. Uh, 
I mean, again, the Snowball Derby just had its 50th race mm -hmm. and um, a year, two years ago. And to think about the the people who have raced here and won. I mean, Kyle Bush. Kyle Busch will go into the NASCAR Hall of oh, Fame, yeah. and you know his win was pretty captivating. And and then you think about a Joanna Long from Pensacola yep. who went to Pine Forest High School, youngest female to ever race in a NASCAR circuit after winning the Snowball Derby. Enormously popular here. The, the people that have raced and the people that have won now, when you look at some of these current NASCAR stars like Eric Jones and some others, they raced here, they won here. Um, and, and to think about what Tim Bryant and his family have done out there with, you know, a, a facility that's pretty bare bones mm -hmm. and, and, and to put on a show like they've put on and what it's meant. You know, that week is probably the greatest extended sports week for, yeah. in terms of the people who are coming here from all over the, uh, the country oh, yeah. and staying here and, the economic, and yeah, the economic impact yeah. of it. And it would take a guy doubt. like Tim because there's not too many better human beings than Tim right. Bryant. Uh, Tim Bryant's a great guy, absolutely, yeah. And, and what a great, uh, that, that, that place has a great history. I mean, Waltrips and Allison's yes. and Wallace. Uh, Rusty Wallace's kid won the thing. Stephen Wallace won the thing. The when greatest awesome. drivers have, have yeah. raced there. I'm really short on time, but I want to run around the table here and just get each one of you to kind of give me what you think the future of Pensacola's sports scene looks like in about 40 seconds. Whew. This uh, is <laughs> page feasibility studies yeah, on this. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we're healthy. I think we have to do a very serious look at what our facilities are in. We have got some facilities that are dated. Uh, we need to find some turf fields. Uh, we need to find some funding to, uh, to uh, modernize some of our facilities. Um, at some point, we've got to improve our indoor facilities. Uh, I know we've, you know we've been working on that for a long time, but I think, uh, I think we have some the athletes are here, the passion is here, but I think the community's got it. We got to make sure that we are we're providing them the facilities that they need to to play. Chad, 30 seconds. I think, yeah, with a daughter growing up that I want to live here, uh, to stay home and, and to see the the community grow, we need more of the complexes to build the future. We have great professional teams and surroundings. Downtown is going up like wildfires. Look right. at the traffic cones, but we need some great sports complexes for the kids for the future. I think the high school athletes are off the charts. I think they're seeing more and more top-notch coaches, especially the high school football scene coming on in. Uh, I, I just think that uh, we're going to see more and more kids play college football and on Sundays uh, in the NFL as well. And I think that the, the hockey with the Ice Flyers obviously is healthy and obviously so, so uh, are the Blue Wahoos as well. Bill? My two dreams, and Ray, you know, I, it are either I remodeled or redone Bay Center because right. I think it's essential mm -hmm. for the community. And, and, a, and my other wish would be a grandstand for Blue Wahoo Stadiums to protect people from the rain and, and have it a little more shaded. I think if you do those two things, you, I, our community, our venues are further enhanced. And I just hope everybody appreciates what we have yeah. because I think sometimes it's overlooked. We're one of the smaller markets doing great things in, in sports. Yeah, for a market this size, we have a great sports scene, I think. Gentlemen, thank you so much. This was fun. We should do this again. I love it. <laughs> Let's do it. Love it. <laughs> thank you so very much for spending some time with us. Uh, we have been talking about Pensacola sports, past, present, and future. Our guests have been Paul Chestnut, the voice of the Pensacola Ice Flyers and host of the Sports Roundtable, which airs weekdays from 11 a.m. to noon on WPNN Radio 103.7 FM and 790 a.m. Ray Palmer is the president and CEO of Pensacola Sports. Bill Balonis, senior writer for BlueWahoos.com and contributor to PNJ.com. And Chad Brilliante, host of Sports Drive with Chad Brilliante, heard weekdays from 5 to 7 p.m. on ESPN Pensacola, 94.5 FM, as well as being simulcast on Blab Television. By the way, this show will be available soon online at WSRE.org as well as on YouTube, so please feel free to share on social media. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself, and we will see you soon.